Howdy folks, I think we're, uh, we're live now. There we go, yep, got a bit of uh, reverb back through the audio system there. It's been a little while since I've uh, set up a live stream, so it took a while to set all the equipment up again, but uh, should all be working. Hey Addy, how are you doing? All right, so. What we'll be doing today is installing these DRAM chips. Um, these ones here onto the butter stick. So these are 256 bits per word. I, I can't remember how the model number works. Basically, they are 512 megabits because it's 256 with the data width of 16. Um, and so two of these chips go on the butter stick uh, to give it one gigabyte of uh, DRAM. Unfortunately, when we had these produced uh, by group gets, I messed up the bill of materials when we had two variants, because we we're going to offer a 25F with uh, two gigabits of memory. So 256 megabytes and then offer the 85F with one gigabyte. And somehow the wires got crossed and the bill of materials ended up as a hybrid of both of those because we only, we upgraded everybody to the 85F, but all the boards were produced with only two gigabits of DRAM, not eight. So I'm just gonna try now to see how tricky it is to um, swap the DRAM across so that, uh, I'd, I mean, I'd like to offer that as a, a way to fix people's boards. If they can get them shipped to me, I can then do the upgrade and then shift them back. Um, Cause unfortunately we don't, the boards have already been shipped out to uh, to everybody. So we don't really have the, the margins in the cost to kind of do a mass recall you know, it's a pretty niche, uh, niche product. So, but, uh, we'll get going here. Let's, um, yeah, here we go. We can put a bit of, uh, music on in the background as well. So the first step will be to use the uh, hot air gun here um, to remove the chips that are on the board right now. Uh, so I'm going to set this to probably about 380 with a pretty much the maximum airflow that this unit will do. And then the temperature on the board is really controlled by the distance that you're holding the, um, the hot air gun away rather than the temperature you actually set. Because the temperature you set is really inside the nozzle versus what's actually on the, the circuit board. Uh, that's one thing with hot air rework is you might think, oh, you'd never want to heat a board up to 380 degrees, but the, the circuit board doesn't actually get that hot. It's just uh, the temperature in the hot air gun. Uh, just grab some tweezers. Let's see if I can uh, manage this. So I think probably the most sensitive component on this heat wise is going to be either the little shroud around this capacitor or the the plastic inside the ethernet shell. I think these two Samtech connectors should be pretty good in terms of heat resistance. Um, but we'll see. I mean, that's one, one point of today's uh, exercise here. It's just to, um, just to kind of, yeah, check and make sure this is, achievable kind of uh, 
as quickly as I think it is. Let me just get this set up on the camera for you. So if you think of a typical reflow process that the circuit board runs through, um, they take about seven minutes to heat up to maximum temperature and then cool back down. So you should kind of be thinking similarly when you're using a hot air gun. Not, You don't really want to be blasting a ton of uh, hot air at the parts. Uh, you know, trying to reflow them in 30 seconds or anything like that. Uh, it's okay to take your time. And what we're looking for in this is that uh, once all the solder is melted, the chip should more or less just be floating on the solder bowls. If it takes any kind of force to kind of remove them, you're at risk of ripping up pads on the circuit board. One challenging thing about this particular design is that it is on a an eight layer PCB and we've made use of uh, wire in pad. So basically the, the wire is directly on the surface mount pad and then they're filled with resin and then plated on top. So that reduces uh, inductance, which is great for BGA parts. Um, makes routing a lot easier, you know? uh, but it means that you do require quite a bit of heat to take the chips off here. So we've got one, it wasn't perfect, but um, it's good enough fast now. So now that there's some heat in the board, the second one should actually come off a little bit easier. There you go. Okay, so you can see the some of these bowls are still molten here. So we just fire up the fire up our um, soldering iron, and then we got to use some uh, some solder wick here to clean up these pads because right now you can kind of see that uh, the solder bowls are all uneven here. Uh, this is kind of expected when you when you take off parts like this uh, you can see if I grab the part that we took off it's quite um, see some of these soda bowls came off entirely and then others it's only just uh, a little bit a little bit of has come off you know between the board and and the part uh, you can see specifically up in this corner these didn't quite get hot enough to kind of melt the same way as the ones down here did. Right, so we'll uh, add a bit more flux here and then use our solder wick to clean up all these pads. And I'm using a pretty large tip on the soldering iron, as you'll see, uh, because it we kind of don't want the wick to run out of heat and get stuck because that's how you can rip off See how it's kind of stuck on one of the bowls here? If it if it does that when you're dragging over, that's how you'd rip off uh, solder pads. So we get a bit more clean wick here. And you want to apply kind of enough heat so that um, 
useful enough kind of pressure so that the solder bowls are actually being absorbed by the wick but you don't really want to be like scraping the circuit board um that's probably enough there we just there we go looks pretty good so you can see the the difference it makes and with solder wick they put a pretty aggressive flux in the wick itself so that you do uh you will need to clean this off with uh, isopropyl which is not something i think i prepared for so i might have to go grab that yeah you make a good point Eston. it's uh sometimes it can be a bit apparent like a bit nerve-wracking uh dragging wick across the board that's why i found the larger tip really make sure that uh, it's not going to get stuck uh, another thing is good quality circuit boards have better adhesive between the copper layer and the substrate so if if you're doing this on uh you know like a 50 cent uh two layer prototype board from china often they you know they have to cut costs somewhere so the adhesive holding the copper foil down to the uh the substrate like the fr4 is actually pretty weak uh, one good thing is that we've put all of the uh all of the pads on this chip are actually are connected um as i mentioned we're using via in pad so some of them don't look like they're connected but um, that's because there is actually a via underneath that you know show you that here there's actually a via in the pad itself um, and then that runs through so that means that the uh, it's more it's more likely the pads will be stayed on like stay on because there there's like a copper connection through to the through the fr4 instead of just being more or less copper foil on top uh, but if one of the pads if if there were a pad that weren't connected and it came off uh that's actually not really a big deal because if it's not connected to anything when you install the new chip on it doesn't actually you know it's not neat but it doesn't matter too much if it's not connected to anything all right so i don't have isopropyl around here so i have to go grab that uh, i'll just be back in a second here All right, so I got myself the uh, bottle eyes appropriate. So um, it's just a general purpose cleaner for electronics, more or less. So we really just want to um, make sure we clean up all the the flux and gunk from uh, the solder wick in specifically uh, in order to make the wicking action easier yeah as I mentioned they use a pretty aggressive flux which leaves quite a bit of this kind of gross residue around everywhere so uh, we really want to get rid of that before we move on to the next step actually got some uh, should be using my Kim wipes uh, just so it doesn't leave as much um, fibers because uh, you can see there's they kind of some of the fibers from that uh, those cloths kind of catch
Okay. I gotta say this is going a bit better than expected. Um, I know I'm pretty proficient when it comes to BGA rework, but I don't actually get to do it very often anymore. So uh, you know, sometimes you feel like you get a bit out of practice. But uh, I know these two parts came off with pretty much without a without a problem now. Yeah, Q-tips can be good. You can actually get kind of specialized Q-tips that have like a flat edge for basically doing this exact stuff. Um, but uh, I just prefer just throwing um, throwing like a Kim wipe underneath my tweezers, just kind of dragging that around. So it looks like maybe we have I can't tell if that's a blob of solder or if they're, um, I think that's actually just solder. It'd be kind of strange to have peeled up in that corner. So I didn't, didn't quite get the, um, the wick right into that corner there. There we go. Much better. Okay. So this is officially a butter stick now without um, without any DRAM uh, and we're pretty much ready to get the new chips out and then solder the, the new chips on here. So yeah, as, as I showed before, these are the, the chips I'll be putting on. So these are the Micron branded um, DDR3L chips, so the lower voltage. Um, so that's MT41K is Micron's way of saying this is DDR3L. And then these are 256 by 16 bits data bus. Or 256 million bits by 16 bit data bus. Uh, so it's basically a 512 megabyte IC. So if you were putting the old chips back on to Uh, back onto another circuit board, you would need to go through and re bowl them either with solder paste and a thick stencil or a, um, a re bowling kit and use solder bowls directly. Because um, you can see the. When they're fresh, you know, they've got a nice, nice uniform uh, solder bowls on the bottom of the BGA package. When they come off a board, uh, none of the the pads are uniform and in fact some of these have no solder and some of them don't have enough to clear this uh, kind of channel in the middle um, so if I wanted to reuse those chips on another board uh, I would need to go through and re-bowl those which is actually a little bit challenging on DDR3 uh, chips because they do have this 
this kind of channel in the middle. I think that's to help with reliability because the channel uh, makes contact with the circuit board and so the chips aren't simply floating on the the, the solder, but um, makes re-bowling them a little bit more challenging. Okay. So we got to make sure we get the orientation right um, in that bottom left corner. And the silk screen here is set up for a slightly different DDR3 package. So you notice these chips are a little bit longer, but a little bit uh, skinnier. Um, so they basically fit here. Sometimes you'll be able to feel the chip kind of fold into place, but I I don't think that's going to happen here because um, some of the extra solder, basically we don't really have a well for the solder balls to, to uh, drop into. So instead we're just going to have to place it close enough so that uh, everything kind of lines up like the solder ball from the package lines up close enough to a pad on the circuit board and then when we hit it with the hot air um, it will solder into place so we just do one of these at a time so the first step is to add flux So this is kind of tacky flux. Um, when you hit it with the hot air, it pretty much turns into a liquid and will, uh, you know, um, cover the whole board. But it stays in place while you're kind of working with it, and it's it won't fully evaporate while we rework. So that's that's the main benefit of using this flux over something that's more liquid um, to start with. So I'm just going to heat up the, heat up my hot air rework um, station here, which is if, if you're looking to buy a hot air rework station, this one's the quick 861 DW, which um, I found is pretty, pretty good, uh, but I've not actually really used many other hot air rework stations, so, um, you know. Take my recommendation with a grain of salt. Um, so I'll turn down the airflow a little bit because we don't want to... Airflow helps transfer the heat from the heat gun to the circuit board. But we don't want to basically fling the parts off. So it's a bit of a trade-off because you... Um, you're basically reducing the amount of thermal energy you can transfer into the part if you reduce the airflow. But it means the parts won't fly away, right? They're not going to turn into a kite. Um, and I'm still using quite a large tip here, as you can see. It might be beneficial to swap to a smaller tip so you can be a bit more precise with where you're applying heat. But... Um, I've not really, it, it, it'll work both ways. It's just a technique thing. So because when we put the chip down, we're basically going to be applying uh, heat to the chip, not the circuit board. We kind of do want to heat the circuit board quite a bit. Um, so that's, that's usually the first step when I'm putting down a part like this is I'll I'll heat the circuit board up a little bit before I kind of place and align the chip. Now our, our airflow here is low enough that uh, yeah we're not at risk of moving the chip with the hot air which is good. It makes it easier. So it means I don't shouldn't have to hold the part if if they're smaller parts, sometimes you do have to hold them with the tweezers. 
and that can be a little bit awkward um, just to get the placement of the hot air gun and the tweezers in your hand in a way that you're not going to burn yourself. So we can kind of monitor the process here by the pads that are around the part that we're reflowing. Oh, there you go. Did you see it? So part of the chip just kind of jumped into place there. And there it did it a little bit more. So what I'm looking at is the pads down here are now molten when I wave the hot air over them and this pad up here turns molten so what we want to do is just make sure we can get all of the pads under the chip molten at the same time not just like one corner and then another corner and we can va validate that by just tapping tapping the edge there and you'll see the part shifted and then shift it back now you don't want to push down on the top of BGA parts because uh, with DRAM it might be okay because of that channel that I was showing you in the middle before but in general if you push down it's so easy to apply too much force and then squash uh, squash solder uh, solder from adjacent bowls together and then that's that's not good. At that point you basically have ruined the part and you need to remove it Rebowl and then fit it again. So while there's still some heat in the... Just take this. This is just a bit of solder that's come off from the earlier removal. So I'll remove that so it doesn't cause any problems. Uh, so while there's still a bit of heat in the circuit board, we can go in and heat this bottom pad bottom footprint and then just kind of place this up approximately where it needs to go now these are quite uh, forgiving in the terms of compared to other BGA packages DRAM chips are 0 0.8 millimeter pitch uh, so you have quite a bit of wiggle room in order to get the placement correct. Compared to other chips, uh, some other, you know, even QFN parts are sometimes more sensitive than that to placement. And it's also a little bit tricky. You have to kind of get a knack for it through the microscope you get a bit of optical parallax. Uh, because it's a stereo microscope, each eye is seeing the chip from a different side. So it's not, you know, it's not really like orthographic projection uh, like you might be used to in 3D modeling software where, you know, you're looking at something essentially at infinity and then all of the rays of light are parallel there we go so you can see i've got the air rate low enough that the air isn't uh, affecting the chip itself and actually i don't i don't know if that's the heat that's moving it like that, or the air. Can't really tell. But, uh... Just want to do the wiggle test here. There we go. So you can see we can kind of wiggle the chip and it falls back into place. So that's, uh, that's a good sign.
Okay. So that's pretty much the rework. So we can uh, just wait until it everything cools back down. Uh, we can inspect some of the damage. So I, I mean, I did take a bit longer than I thought, heating up some of those parts. Um, you can see there's a little bit of damage on this. Probably not going to be able to focus on that with the microscope range I've got. You see a little bit of damage on the Samtech connector. Uh, not severe, but, uh, you know, that part did get hot. So one thing you could do is you could put some alfoil around sensitive components if they're really sensitive. Um, which I might set up a little jig to do that for if I'm doing a batch of these boards. Um, you can see just here on the corner was the other part that I was worried about because the plastic around uh, capacitors like this is often really only spec'd for just reflow temperatures. So with hot air you can uh, heat them up above, you can heat up the surface of these parts above like 300 celsius and so that's when they'll start to melt. Uh, yeah, Capton can also help with uh, thermal shielding. Basically, if you can just get a little bit of air between the part and what's your uh, the hot air gun, that's usually all, all you need. Um, air is a pretty good insulator, so if you if you can put a cover that just absorbs that initial heat, um, then you should be uh, golden. Okay, so that's that's the chip soldered on. Uh, there's kind of too much stuff to easily visually inspect these. Uh, but I could tell from the rework that I'm very doubtful there would be any pads under there that have uh, melted together, just given how well they um, snapped into place. And how little extra movement there was. So the next step here is to load up some gateware that we can then test test with. So I think the easiest way to do that, I haven't, it's on my to-do list to set up the USB uh, ACM abstract control model, kind of the USB serial device so that we could see the terminal over uh, just the USB connection. So instead I'm going to just take one of the uh, one of the pins out of the Syzygy connector and use that for a, a TTO serial connection. So I could do that with one of these handy breakout boards. Uh, I've just got a solder. They don't come with connectors pre-soldered, so I have to uh, solder these in myself. Uh, and then the same with just the ground connections here. and power. I don't have a fancy uh, assembly jig, so I'm gonna have to eyeball some of this. I know if you do a lot of through-hole soldering, you can get Almost like vices where you can lock in through hole parts from the back. Um, but I, I don't have that. I thankfully only do mostly surface mount soldering. So what we do is we just take the flux on to make that easier. Grab the solder wire. Just 
just tack those in. So we just got to make sure that they're kind of flat on the circuit board and not crooked. Uh, that looks fine to me. And we'll see if we can do the same for the smaller connector. Then the ground. Alright, so this uh, this ground one's a little bit crooked. So I just put in a, a flux. I'm trying only to hold the, the pin that I'm not heating up, otherwise you'll uh, burn your finger. Alright, so they're all connected straight. So I can throw it in the stick vise. So the reason I didn't have it in the stick vise before is that it holds the board too far off my base here. So these wouldn't be touching, uh, touching the surface. Uh, which actually I should just, I should hold down these just to solder the other end. Otherwise, they're a little bit long and they might, um, you know, you could, they could be like lifted up at one end. And again, this is a little bit awkward. I mean, it's not too bad with the camera through the microscope, but uh, just with all the pressure of... Uh, People on the internet watching me, you know, don't want to make a mistake here. All right, so we just go ahead and uh, solder all these other pins. Actually, if I'd known um, that they were going to use these labels, I would have designed an actual space for the label. So it wouldn't have been as close to the uh, to the pads here that people have to solder. You know, like it, it could have easily been up here if these pads had been moved a little bit. Uh, but when I designed the board, I didn't, didn't realize uh, that these would even have a label like that. All right. So these ground pins have a little bit of extra thermal mass because they're connected straight to a ground plane. I mean, that there's thermal relief, but um, thermal relief only goes so far. They still wick away more heat than, uh, than these pads only have a single trace going through them. Okay. 
almost done. So I didn't need to solder all of the pins just for a serial connection, but uh, I figure if I don't solder all the pins now, then uh, next time I go to use this breakout, uh, I'll inevitably try to use pins that aren't soldered. Uh, so if we put it on port A, uh, so that's now plugged in. I guess we probably need a um, a computer setup so we can uh, take a look at the gateway that we'll load on here. Um, and then once we've loaded gateway on, uh, I'll just be using the the tie guard board. Uh, which is basically just a uh, handy little FTDI uh, breakout. See there, FTDI. Uh, so it just breaks out serial UART, um, SPY, I2C, stuff like that. Um, and then it's also got level shifters on there, so it's kind of handy to, to do everything because this board will be 3.3 volts, and so you don't want a, a 5 volt, you know, uh, serial connection or anything like that. So I need to move some things around to get the computer hooked up here. I'll just leave you with some uh, some more background music here. I think I should be able to bump that up. It's just a mix from YouTube. So I knew I'd need to have the computer connected, but I didn't really think this far ahead. So I need to move a couple of bits and pieces around on my desk to make room. Unfortunately, the computer that's doing the streaming is also is not the one that I've got all the FPGA tools installed on. I found streaming just kind of works better on Windows. It's 
that makes everything a bit more complex here. I think, think this is working. <laughs> let's see. So it's just a little bit tricky uh, on my end, actually. I think I've got a better way to do this. Yeah, so, so you can see something, but it's not mirrored. So I have to be watching the OBS preview to work out what I'm doing. Uh, so just got to mirror the displays here. Oof, man, my window manager doesn't like that. All right. I think we're almost, almost there. Uh, terminal I prepared earlier. Uh, so this is basically the just this here. We'll just uh, drop that to be a bit more in the background. All right. So this is basically just a duplication. Good. 
We'll see if this uh, sticks. It may have changed the resolution when I... Yeah. All right. So, oh, yeah, okay, I, I see what's happening. There we go. Okay, so this is basically just the butter stick target from Litex. Um, I've just copied the, the Python file into another project. So we can take a look here. Um, and then I've got a terminal. Which I can uh, bump the size up a little bit for you. All right. So pretty much when we run the Python GSD part of stick pi uh, build, that's just going to go through the Litex process of building the SOC with uh, DRAM support based on info from this file. So So that's the first step. And we've got options here now to switch the RAM type. So we'll be able to do that. We want to make sure that it's outputting on the Syzygy breakout as a serial connection. So that's what we have to do here. So you are name. It's a little interesting because the, the chip shouldn't have the the definition for the board doesn't have like a dedicated serial connection. So that's um I think we will have to have to work out. Um, and as I've mentioned here, talking about if serial is mentioned as a UART name, it will enable crossover mode, which uh, I don't think we want. That's that would let it run the serial terminal through the UART. Um, so it would run the serial terminal instead of through the UART, it would run through the Ethernet um, through what Litex calls Etherbone, which is more or less a Ethernet to wishbone adapter that could let code on your computer talk to a wishbone bus in the SOC via Ethernet. Uh, but we don't want to do that here. We just want plain old serial. So what we'll do is we'll comment out these. We'll make sure we are using a serial a serial UART name. And then if we build this, uh, you can see it's almost finished uh, the place and route. So I'll just let that complete, even though we'll, we won't be using this SOC. Or maybe not. I think there's a couple of congested routes that it's trying to solve here. So it might just be better to quit that. So if we basically set the UART name to serial. So Litex will try to put in a, uh, a serial connection to the SOC, and that's where all the, the debug and the BIOS will be sent to. But the platform doesn't have a definition of a serial port. So it should give us an error here. 
There we go. Resource not found, cereal. Oh, bye, Addy. Yeah, I'm sure it's uh, not a very good time in the time zone here. It's, you know, middle of the day in Australia, so it's probably middle of the night in the UK, right? Okay, so 3 a.m. Yeah. Okay, so to fix this, we need to add a definition of a serial port to the platform. And we want to add that to the Syzygy connector. So let's see if I can remember how to do this correctly. So it's it should be at config no oh it's, it's part of the platform before we initiate the soc we want to add a connector and it's not uh, uh okay so i think what i'll do here is I want to open up the platform for something like the orange crab would be a good option. So the orange crab does the same thing. You basically define connectors and then so we want this on Syzygy zero. S0, Syzygy 0, S1, TXRX serial, Syzygy 0. Okay. So what we've done is we basically, we're basically hooking into part of the uh litex resource manager and telling it that we can use connector pins as like a function um so here we're, we're defining transmit and receive as syzygy 0 s0 and s1 so the sing single ended uh zero and one so that'll correspond to some pins on the breakout here. And then we need to tell the platform that we're doing that. Again, that's used on the orange crab. So I'm going to jump back to that. So this is the target file for the orange crab in the uh litex boards package and i think we do it here oh maybe not okay so we're just gonna have to be digging through a bit more code Uh, it's part of the platform constraint manager add extension this is what we need so for some reason my um hints aren't working i think it's because of how they import various uh, platforms um but we're going to add extension and then serial syzygy zero so this will tell the platform pile that we now have a serial port and it's going to be using pins on the Syzygy breakout. Uh, and all the, those pins are defined in this platform file. If you go all the way to the bottom, uh, this is Syzygy zero single ended pins. Uh, and I have, 
We'll fill this out. It's a pull request that's open right now that gives Syzygy 1, 2, and 3 um, pins. But what we should find is that now that we've told Litex about this, we should have a serial transmit. Yep. Serial transmit should be mapped to G0. And then serial receive should be mapped to J3. So if we just build, sub signal is not defined. All right. So we just need to add basically sub signal pins and IO standard aren't defined in this file yet. So there, I, I, mean, I know from experience, they're part of Litex build generic platform. So once you add that, uh, the errors have gone away. Um, okay, so that's building. Now what we can do is take a look at the files that it generates. We've got this Verilog file. You can see we've now got a serial transmit and receive, which is good. That's what we want. Um, and that's what the BIOS will output on. And then if we jump to the LPF, which is the, what that stand for? Logical pinout file or uh, something preference file. Uh, basically it defines what pins in the FPGA correspond to what signals in Verilog. And you can see transmit is on G0, receive on J3, which is what we want. Now there's one final step here that this SOC that we're trying to build uh, won't work because the butter stick has configurable IO voltages for the Syzygy banks. And by default, they will be turned off. So even though we'd be outputting UART, um, we wouldn't have any voltage on those IO banks. So that's uh, the next step here. And I probably need to make this a bit simpler, but that's something I can work on a little bit later. What we want to do is grab the VCC IO control pins. which is part of the platform request. So in the platform file, we have, or we don't have, okay. So that, uh, that's not gonna work. We're gonna have to add those. Um, So this file is somewhat incomplete now. Uh, I didn't realize it was missing those pieces. So I'll just grab those. Just gotta make sure I don't have any other, um, don't leak any sensitive information here. So I know those files are part of the Butterstick test project. So that's just what I'm opening up now. Or the bootloader, the bootloader will also have it. Gateware, RTL, platform. Uh, yeah, this one's got it. So this is just the platform file that's built into the bootloader. And it's got definitions here for the VCCIO control pins. So we'll just paste that in here. Again, that shouldn't be anything you'd have to do. I, 
I need to clean up the platform file a bit and add some of these uh, features. So that's just called VCCO control. Okay. Uh, and now we can just make this pretty basic to start with. All we want to do is set the PDM values to zero and then turn on the VCC IO controller. So this will basically turn on IO, the all three IO banks at the highest voltage they run at, which is 3.3 volts. Uh, give or take, I think there's a bit of wiggle room in there, so it might end up being about 3.4 or maybe you tried to hit 3.6, but 3.3, 3.6 volts thereabouts. Um, so what you do normally with the VCCIO control scheme is you would supply the, the, the pins I've got labeled as PDM here they would be supplied by a pulse density modulator block or a PWM block. And then that goes through a filtering on the board that then generates a voltage that's used to uh, bias the voltage for the IO banks. So there's a bit of hardware protection in here. If we set this just to one, well, there's three of them here, so it'll be, um, if we set them all to one, just the way the voltage controllers work and how the maths works out, that's going to set them to their lowest voltage, which for these is about 1.1 volts because we wanted to hit the range of 1 1.2, 1 1.8, uh, you know, 2.5, 3.3 volts. Those are the kind of the standard IO voltages. Um, and then if we were to set these to zero, then it's the maximum voltage for all the ports. So that's what we'll do here. Turn the controller on and then build. So I've messed something else up here. 156. I just deleted uh, a line now. Okay, so with this building, it should work, but there's other things that could go wrong. So <laughs> we'll let this build and then we'll load it up on the FPGA and um, take it from there. So we, um, do this. Okay. We can crop out the um, terminal so you can see it uh, building away the SOC there. Um, so what's going to happen is that serial will be transmitted on single-ended port 0, which is D0P, and received on single-ended port 1, which is actually D1P. So what happens is these are, if you look at the Syzygy specifications, the single-ended ports go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. They kind of alternate across the connector. And then the differential pairs end up being on, like these are all even. So it's 0, 2, 4, 6, uh, or 1, 3, 5, 7. So we just need to connect our tie guard board up to 0 and P, uh, 0 and 1, D0 P, D1 P. So we've got that here. We'll just uh, use the handy breakout cable. 
So we're swapping transmit and receive. I think that's how these are wired, but we might have to play the old UART guessing game. You know, is my uh, transmit and receive swapped or not? Uh, and then on the tie guard, that connector plugs into this port on the top. Uh, so we want the target, ground, transmit and receive. Okay, and before we plug it in, we, we've connected VTarget to VCCIO. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll connect that all the way down to the bottom. And I'll probably move this mat because it's a metal mat. It's mostly on the desk to protect protect my desk during the rework um, from the hot air. But we don't want it to short out anything on the bottom of the tie guard. So we can remove that. We'll put that there. Okay, so our SOC is finished building. We can now open up another terminal. Uh, so we need some USB cables. Let me just grab those. Forever running out of uh, USB cables. Okay. Right, so we've got one for the. Actually, here we can. Uh... Um... No, we probably don't need to see that. So when the tie guard plugs in, it'll come up as a serial port. So we can just use screen to connect to that. So USB zero and then the speed. And then we'll plug in the butter stick while holding down the buttons here, uh, button zero specifically. Let's see if I can get that in frame. And so that starts up our bootloader. So now we can use DFU util. Okay, so what we're gonna have to do, this particular target doesn't add the DFU suffix. So we just have to kind of force the Force it to use the correct um, part number. Uh, basically, without the DFU suffix, it doesn't know what device to load a bitstream onto. So, uh, I think, let me just, it's been a little while since I've done this. Yeah, so device, vendor, and product. Okay. Twelve oh nine. Five A F one. So this is just the USB PID and uh, uh, VID and PID numbers. We want to target Alt zero, which is our gateway offset, and. And we want to load the bit file. So this will go ahead and load, but it won't um, 
won't restart the FPGA right now. Oh, and there's another, okay. This, um, we really need to, so we should be able to compress the bitstream. I don't think right now it's running through with a compressed bitstream. Which I feel like that should be uh, on by default in LaTeX. I've got to open an issue about that. Because uh, it could be a lot faster if we'd enabled bitstream compression. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll use E. I don't know why it's E, but it's going to detach. Um, and so now it should be running. Oh, there we go. So that was the... Oh, right. Because there's no bitstream compression, from the flash it has to load two megabytes into the FPGA. So it takes a little while because uh, it's also running at the slowest flash speed. Uh, we can fix that in a minute, I'll, I'll show you. So basically if we unplug this and then plug it back in, it's running at single, um, single spy data rates and at the slowest flash speed, which I think is, um, actually, I don't know what the slowest is. It's like a one or two megahertz clock speed, but we can easily bump it up to 38 is what I usually do. And um, we can bump up the speed so that it, uh, it loads faster because we can get Bitstream's loading in a couple of milliseconds if they're if it tries loading them faster. Okay. Okay, so I just add that to the uh, I'll add that to my file here. So we built, we can then, this is just code out of the Butterstick bootloader. So we don't need a boot address. Um, and And this is our bitstream. So I don't know why. Oh, maybe it doesn't like. Uh... config and bitstream. Again, I, I feel like these should probably be default options for all lattice platforms in LaTeX is to enable the compression option and then also the frequency. I think there's a way you can plug those numbers in, but I don't recall. Oh. Um, they might be exposed through the command line arguments. Yeah, yeah, e, ECB pack. Okay, so actually I don't technically need them, but uh, it'll be easier just to use them in here. Okay, so if I skip the build option, It should just run through firmware and then um, patch in. It's now done the suffix and it's compressed the bitstream. So 
it hasn't actually it hasn't patched the the firmware uh, in that's not that's not enabled by default in I don't think uh, we're back. <laughs> yeah, it was just uh, and... I don't know if that's uh, my I'm on Wi Fi here. That was just my Wi Fi flaking out. Or not? Um, yeah, I don't know, but uh, it's not dropping frames now, so I guess that's a good thing. Anyway, we're we're pretty much wrapped up here, I think. But um, so I've just built it with the compression and the DFU enabled. So all we need to do now is use the DFU instead and. We don't need to define a device now. So I'll just... Oh, actually, I don't need to... We don't need to unplug it, but... So now we'll load our new bitstream and um, see how much quicker that was. So, you know, I'll... I'll get the webcam of uh, the microserve view in here as well. So, so if you just remember before, it was taking a couple of seconds to start up. Now we plug it in, it's pretty much instantaneous. So that's just because we've now got uh, bitstream compression, which uh, is good, and which reduces file size for something like this. Yeah, you can see it's now um 580 kilobytes instead of two megabytes you know so one eighth of the size that it has to load and then we're also running it now at 38 megahertz um yeah i've got a recording running on my computer uh the recordings up will be up on twitch as well but i don't know how twitch recordings vods work when a stream drops out i think it turns into two but um, yeah, so what we need to do is basically this um, is still built with not thinking uh, that it's got all the memory. So we've told it that the uh, the chips installed on this board are the 64. So we just need to rebuild the SOC with a different SD RAM device. Um, And I think that's the command we use. SD RAM device, SD RAM device. Okay. So now that basically just tells Litex um, what, uh, that we've got larger chips. Oh, I wish it took that long, but uh, will take a little bit longer to recompile all the gateware. 
synthesize that down. So I'll let that one run. Um, yeah, I've got a local recording as well, so that's uh, something I can throw up on YouTube probably. Okay, and then we just need to work out what command we run here to validate that we've got all the memory. So there's a command in Litex BIOS that lets you list memory regions like this. And then um, we could do a mem test. And it wants an address, so we put an address and then the max size. Um, and then this will run through the CPU doing a test. So it's definitely not indicative of the actual speed that you can get out of SDRAM. Um, this is running through the CPU accessing uh, via the L2 cache addresses one by one. Because um, I think this runs at about 10 megabytes, 15 megabytes a second. Um, whereas the speed from the SDRAM is substantially faster if you're using it directly. Uh, here we go. So, Interestingly, it didn't get all the way to the... Ah, I've not... Is this only compiled with 128 megabytes? That's kind of interesting. There's two chips, so it should be... Um... No, right, 100... Uh... No, it should be 256, the default. Anyway, there's a couple of things I need to work out with the SOC here, but the the main point is when we rebuilt the BIOS, it will then be able to know to talk to more memory. Because right now it's like it the CPU doesn't know that it has one gigabyte of memory available. So we'll just do a reset here. Yeah, and do have to unplug it. Cool. Okay. So now back in the BIOS, in the bootloader, sorry. So we'll build this. Load up our new SOC. This, this time, the SOC has been built knowing that it's got more memory. So if we uh, drop this over here, uh, screen doesn't let you scroll up. Let me it's one problem with screen that uh, just reboot. Okay, so uh, did that work? I don't think... It's still only Right, there's a little bit, um, oh, you can in screen, control AS, JK. Ah, oh, so you can move the cursor up. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's, I guess it's because it's a, um, it's set up with like any cursors inside of the terminal. So you, it's not, not using the terminal scroll um, like the window terminal scroll, which means the, uh, the scroll wheel kind of works. Okay, that's cool. 
I didn't know that. Um, so it's interesting. The main RAM was not made any larger. Unless we have to specifically make that um, when we build it, make that a string. Oh, listen. Okay, let's try that. Should be able to see in the BIOS when it's built. It will, it generates these header files. So SOC. Um, and then the ID RAM. Or memory. Okay. So again, now it's only defined us 128 megabytes of memory. Interesting. Okay, there's probably something going on here that I've not worked out, but we can simply override the memory here so that it will... There we go. So for some reason, just the command line interface wasn't working. I need to work out why that is. But now the SOC is built with the correct amount of memory. So the, the physical connections to the DRAM controller were all still there, but it's just the SOC itself doesn't know that it can address that much memory, uh, but now it can. And so what I want to be able to show here is that the, the DRAM, we can test all of the memory. And then I'll grab another unmodified butter stick and run the same test and we should see it fail. Uh, once it gets to the kind of the middle mark of or one quarter through memory. Uh, the 256 megabyte boundary it should uh, should fall over. Okay, so while that's running, I'll just go grab another butter stick. Okay. 
and tail. Uh, nope, that one's not going to work. Uh, the butter stick I just picked up uh, already has more RAM on it. You don't need to grab a unmodified one. Okay. So now I've got uh, got a factory fresh butter stick. Okay. Ooh. So, if you've just uh, recently joined, um, we basically removed... Uh, so there was a mix-up with the bill of materials on the Group Gets Butter Stick um, run. And so unfortunately, all the boards ended up with less DRAM than we initially advertised, so... We've uh, been offering people uh, a store coupon for the difference in price. Uh, but I'd like to, if people really wanted the extra memory, um, if they're able to send me the board um, and then I can uh, retrofit it with memory for them and then send it back. Uh, that's... That's what we're trying today. So I've updated, basically removed the BGA parts on this board, the two DRAM chips, and installed larger ones. And now we're just going through with the gate where uh, an SOC in Litex to configure the DRAM controller to see the extra RAM and uh, run through a memory test. So it's kind of held up on this uh, couple of these routes here, I think. But... Should clear. Often it's uh, some of the SOC and um, DRAM controller stuff that's loaded into the FPGA ends up with quite a lot of tightly packed cells and so that's why that's why here it's kind of taking so long it's just the last couple of steps it gets to have to route wires between different cells in the FPGA and um, it can't fit them with the existing wires that it's run so it has to rip up old wires and rerun them Um, but if this doesn't take over, I could, uh, we can try something else in a minute. In fact, I think I'll start up another process here. Um, not on the new window. There we go. What we could do is we could jump into the build folder. And what's running now is basically a command in this script. 
and we can just run this but with a different so router 2 is a new router as part of next pnr but it doesn't quite uh it's supposed to be faster because it does it more in parallel but it doesn't quite get as good timing but um ah, we might as well just try it here there's a new feature the experimental timing driven ripper in router 2. so we enable that now nextpnr is not very multi-core uh, optimized so it's actually perfectly acceptable to run multiple threads like this because one isn't really going to slow down the other So we're seeing we might be able to uh, outpace the router one timing here. The the one issue is that this will probably try to save um, the JSON file in the same file. So actually, we probably do want to quit that just because we didn't specify a different file. But we'll see if this runs through faster. In my experience, it's typically faster, but there's some designs where it uh, it gets stuck with one or two routes that it just can't uh, can't manage. Okay, you can see our design's pretty. Tame. We don't have really any any timing fail um, routes here, so this should complete if it doesn't get stuck. There we go. So you can see that was a bit quicker, and then what we'll have to do is just rerun this without the build option and then that will execute a couple of final commands to create the uh the dfu uh stuff so put the board back into bootloader mode load our Bitstream. Okay, so we're back basically back to where we were, but now you can see our memory is listed as 512 um, Gibby bytes at 16 bits. So I think that's correct because that means one gigabyte in 8 bit. Um, with 8-bit kind of uh, stuff. The terminology is a little bit strange. But. So if you go to list, we'll see that we now have two listed here. If we can run the mem test. Starting at four, running for all right, so we're running a mem test over 512 megabytes. It should. It should be listing it as one gig because each chip is 512. Um, I'll look at what's uh, what's up with that because it might be where we're missing out with some of the memory. It's a little bit of an interesting configuration with this board because we've got two chips and they're actually sharing the address and data bus uh, is that right 
Or maybe they're only showing the... Anyway, they're, they're set up in dual rank mode. So, light DRAM is supposed to support dual rank. Um, but it could be there's just something wrong in the configuration of everything through there. Uh, because the chips that we did install just somewhere on my bench here. Um, yeah, they were definitely the, the correct ones. Okay, so that's passed. This should still be, I think, listed as one more, one extra. Like if we start at six, no, that's probably not going to work. Yeah, access error. Uh, but that's that's because the SOC doesn't know about that memory space. Um, well. Throw on a factory fresh SOC and I'll just see how it compares. And then I'll need to take a look through uh, some of the configuration and stuff to work out uh, what else is going on here. Alright, so we've got factory fresh. We'll load our bitstream. Okay, so now we just run the same mem test. Now this should fail one quarter of the way through, but I don't. So when it hits 128 or 256 megabytes, it Ah, uh, why don't you fail on the read? I'm not quite sure how the mem test works, whether it's, um, it only validates when it's reading back, like it writes memory and then when it goes to read it back, that's when it'll fail. Because it's different for a mem speed, which tries to do, yeah, different stuff. Side of the lids are too small. They're uh Yeah, they're pretty fun, I think. Um, so they're RGB one by one millimeter. Um, and then I don't uh, have them display some uh, a different pattern here, but uh, so yeah, I'm not sure. I, I thought I could use the mem test. Ah, oh, here we go. Errors. So it's only showing half of the memory is given errors. Uh, which should be more than that. So I think what's happening is it's not entirely passing the correct total amount of memory through to the BIOS. Um, so I'll take a look at that off stream in a minute. I'm uh, kind of sip lunch and it's now 2.30, so I've got to make myself a sandwich. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of shows that 
it is detecting some of the RAM, but probably not all of it just yet. Um, and then that's, uh, yeah, so I'd say that's a success. Yeah. As far as the BGA swapping is concerned, um, so we went through and swapped the, the two DRAM chips on the butter stick for larger. Um, larger DRAM chips that should have come with initially, but we, due to a, a mix up on the bill of materials um, that I was in charge of, it uh, they didn't get populated with these chips. And so, yep, just looking at the viability of how to, how easy they are to swap. And it looks like we've successfully swapped some chips. I think that was right at the start of the stream. It really took, um, took, I don't know, once we got up and running, less than 10 minutes. Um, unfortunately, it's just a bit of a pain to get stuff to and from Australia right now. Um, 15 minutes, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so if you have a butter stick and you wanted me to do the upgrade, um, uh, I might end up buying some DRAM from LCSC myself, or if you can source the DRAM and then ship it with the butter stick, uh, either way works. Uh, and just get in touch with me on a DM or um, email and um, yeah, I'll get you details of where to ship the boards and more more details with how to get these fixed up. Um, yeah, if you wanted to try the BGA swap yourself, Asden, then, uh, you know, that... Uh, I had a blast today, so I'm sure you will as well. Okay, so I think that probably wraps it up here. Hope you guys uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, catch you on the next stream, which, uh, I don't know, given the, my streaming history might be in another six months. We'll, uh, we'll see. Have a good one. See ya.